this on? No? Oh, okay. Um, I'm recording this lecture because I think it's important for students who arrive later in the semester to be able to review the first week lecture. So uh, this course is important for British writers' works. Uh, there are a lot of British writers and there are a lot of important British writers. Uh, so when I was designing this course, I kept thinking about what we should read. Uh, and you've taken the introduction to British literature, right? Okay, and so you've covered a lot of the classic works. Uh, if you have an interest in Shakespeare, uh, we have a Shakespeare course. If you have an interest in poetry, we have a poetry course. So I thought uh, in this course we could read some things that perhaps you may not have much of a chance to read uh, in other courses in our department. So uh, first we're going to read uh, a play called Dr. Faustus by Christopher Marlowe. Uh, he was a playwright in the 16th century, and I will talk to you a bit more about that uh, later today, to prepare you for next week. Uh, after Faustus, starting week five, we will read from Paradise Lost by John Milton. This is the most important work of British literature in the 17th century. Uh, Paradise Lost is an epic. Uh, it's a, a poem of about uh, 12,000 lines. Uh, and the subject matter is the story of how uh, Satan deceived Adam and Eve into eating the forbidden fruit and thereby caused them to be exiled from paradise. Uh, but the interesting thing about this story, the way that Milton tells it, is that the hero of the story isn't Adam or Eve or even God. The hero of the story is Satan. And this, this can be very strange because we think of Satan as the devil, as evil, and yet uh, from the beginning of the poem we follow his story. Um, now I'm not going to ask you to read all 12,000 lines. I'm taking selections. Uh, if you don't know, this is the Norton Anthology of English Literature. It has 15 editors, and this is chapter, or volume one. Uh, so there's a lot of British literature, a lot of English literature. Uh, we're going to be reading selections from this work, uh, which includes all of Paradise Lost. Uh, the total is around 12,000 lines. I'm only going to ask you to read about 1,400 lines over three weeks. So that's about four to 500 lines a week, which shouldn't be too bad. Um, I've chosen what I believe are the most interesting parts of the poem, uh, and so we can read and discuss them together. The midterm, week nine, uh, will cover these two texts, Dr. Faustus and Paradise Lost. The midterm will take place on Moodle. I'll show you a bit later on the Moodle page. You will have one week to complete the exam. It's take home, open book, open internet, open dictionary. In fact, you can use whatever resources you want except for other people. Please do not discuss the exam with other people. Uh, you can write to me to ask questions if you want and I will try to help you as much as I think would be fair. Uh, but don't talk to anybody else. Uh, now, what this means is the exam will not be easy because you can use so many resources. Um, and I'll talk to you a bit more about that when we discuss uh, how this course will proceed. After midterms, uh, the main focus of the second half of the course is a Jane Austen novel called Persuasion. Now, if you're familiar with Jane Austen, you have probably heard of or even read 
her most famous books like Pride and Prejudice or Sense and Sensibility. I deliberately chose a Jane Austen novel that fewer people have read uh, for fun uh, so that we can uh, approach it as a new text together uh, on an equal ground. Persuasion is Jane Austen's uh, last novel, last finished novel. It was published actually after she died. So on the one hand, we might think that this is her most mature novel, the novel that she wrote with the most experience. Uh, but so when we, when we read the novel, some parts may lead us to rethink this idea. Um, and we're going to be reading the entire novel. Uh, I will provide all of these texts uh, in handouts to you uh, over the course of the semester. We'll be reading four chapters per week. There are a total of 24 chapters. Now again, four chapters may sound like a lot, but uh, the chapters are actually quite short. For instance, chapter one only took me like five minutes to read. Uh, of course, I'm an English professor, so I probably read faster than you. Uh, but it shouldn't take you too long either. Oh. So to, to prepare you for entering the world of Jane Austen, uh, week 10, we will first be watching a Jane Austen film. Uh, it's a relatively recent film, Love and Friendship, from 2016. Now, Love and Friendship is a short novel that Austen wrote when she was like 14. So it will be quite different from uh, what we actually read. And also, it's a movie. Movies are, of course, very different. Uh, the short novel, Love and Friendship, actually is an epistolary novel, which means that the entire novel is told through letters that characters write to each other. Uh, so that's another difference. But of course, the movie doesn't just show people writing letters. It actually does give us the, the story and lets us see what happens. Uh, so we'll spend six weeks on the novel. Week 17, we'll be reading some uh, English poetry from the First World War. Uh, and I decided that we'll read these poems because uh, poems from the First World War in England are especially powerful. Before the First World War, most people's ideas of war were very positive. They thought of war as manly combat, where people, uh, soldiers can win glory and honor and, and defend their country, things like that. But the First World War is the first major uh, widespread war to include things like machine guns, trench warfare, uh, and even near the end of the war, tanks. Uh, and as you might imagine, there is significantly less honor and glory to be had when you're charging against machine guns and tanks versus when you're just fighting another soldier. So this new kind of uh, mechanized warfare totally destroyed people's ideas of the positive uh, notions of war. And one of the uh, ways that the, the uh, experience of the First World War was communicated was through poetry. Uh, these are short poems, uh, but they each focus on a particularly uh, heartbreaking or ironic uh, aspect of being a soldier in the First World War. And even today when we read them, they can be very powerful and emotional. So we're going to read a few of those in week 17. Week 18 is the final exam, and it follows the same rules as the midterm exam. The final exam will only ask you about the novel. The, the poems are just to give you a week to relax. Uh, and so that is the general outline of the course. Do you have questions so far? OK. Um, so I will give you the Dr. Faustus handout a little later. Uh, you'll notice that the, the schedule for Faustus seems a bit unbalanced, right? Week two, we read prologue to scene four. Week three, we're reading scene five only. And then week four, we're going to finish the rest of the play. Now, the reason it looks like this is because scene five is very, very long. 
Uh, so actually, the, the page numbers are about balanced. Uh, the same for the selections from Paradise Lost. Week five, we're going to read selections from six books. Week seven, we're going to read uh, selections from only book nine. And then week eight, we're going to read selections from the rest of the poem uh, up to book 12. And again, this is because book nine is very important. Uh, book nine is when the actual seduction of Eve and Adam occurs, when they actually do the wrong thing uh, that causes original sin. So I selected more from book nine than from the other books. So you're going to be reading uh, a lot of book nine and a bit less of the other books. So again, it's not actually unbalanced uh, when you look at the page numbers. Okay, so that's what we're going to be reading. But what are we going to be doing uh, aside from reading? Uh, the percentages for this course, 20% is attendance. Speaking of which. 40% midterm, 40% final. Don't be scared. Uh, I'm not going to grade your exam from 0 to 40. I'm going to grade it something like 28 to 39. As long as you hand in an exam or submit an exam online, uh, there will be a minimum score that you will receive. In other words, as long as you show up to class, participate, and do the exam sincerely, you will pass. Now, in exchange, I hope that when you do come to class, you're not just uh, you know, daydreaming or whatever, but you actually participate. And you will have a lot of opportunity to participate because this class is almost entirely based on group discussions. I'll divide you into small groups a bit later. Each week, before you come to class, please finish reading the assigned text or the, the range of the assigned text. And it's important because when you come to class, I will directly give you uh, one question per group and give you uh, as much time as you need to discuss this question. And after everyone has finished discussing, I will invite, invite each group to share your answers with the class. And as you share your answers, I will engage with your answers, and we will uh, broaden and deepen your ideas. And so starting from these local points of questions, we can get a broader, more general understanding of the text. Uh, and in fact, the questions have all been written, they have all been prepared. Uh, let me show you the Moodle page. Okay, so this is the Moodle page. Uh, attendance, you can't see that. That's for me only. Uh, but as you can see, each week's questions have already been prepared and uploaded. Um, so in fact, when you start reading for the next week's class, you can uh, take a look at the questions first to help guide your reading, uh, to help you determine uh, what might be the more important parts that you really have to focus on. Another thing that you can do when you're reading to help you uh, get a grip on the text is to take notes as you are reading. So not just in class or after class, but while you read. And these notes can be uh, brief summaries of maybe uh, each section or each paragraph, or even when you think something important is happening. And you'll want to write this down to help you remember, first of all, to help you remember. Uh, because if you take notes while you read, it uh, helps strengthen your memory of that part. But secondly, it's so that when you go back and look for something in the text, or you want to review the text before the exam, uh, it will be a way to do that faster. Because it's much faster to read your summaries than it is to reread the entire thing. Uh, so hopefully this will help you to finish each, each week's reading. Uh, and finally, the last suggestion I would have for you is when you encounter a word that you do not know, try not to jump immediately to a dictionary. 
Uh, English words are defined not actually by a dictionary. They're defined by the way that people use those words in different contexts, or in different texts, in different situations. Uh, and dictionary editors collect evidence of how people use the language in order to make a dictionary. Uh, so in fact, if you can kind of guess what this word might mean, if you can still have a general idea of what's going on, uh, it's better to keep reading than to stop and check every word. If you do get completely lost, and you have no idea what's going on, then of course go check a dictionary. But please try to use an English to English dictionary. Uh, as we all know, things get lost in translation. But also, if you use an English to Chinese dictionary, in fact, most English to Chinese dictionaries only use two or three actual different paper dictionaries as a source. So even if you go look up five different English to Chinese dictionaries, chances are you will only actually be seeing one or two different translations. What if they get it wrong? For example, what is the difference between terror and horror? If you check in any English or Chinese dictionary, most of them will give you the same definition, culture. But there's a difference. There's a reason that we call scary movies horror films and not terror films. And the reason is because horror isn't just about being scared. There's also an element of disgust, being repulsed, uh, something that you want to stay away from because it feels disgusting to you. And that's also why some horror films aren't actually scary. For example, there's like zombie comedies that are also called horror films, horror comedies. And if you think of horror only as being scary, that makes no sense, right? How can you be scared and laugh at the same time? But it's because when they say horror comedy, they mean it's kind of disgusting, not really scary. That's something that an English Chinese dictionary may not tell you. Also, because we're reading texts from like a long time ago, words have, may have different meanings in the text that we read uh, versus what we know today. For example, the word nice. Today, of course, means like good, kind, fine. But it used to mean something completely different. Nice used to mean detailed, fastidious, meticulous, uh, sensitive to small differences, which is completely different from what we know today. Another example is the word want. Of course, today when I say I want something, it means like I want to have it, right? Uh, but it used to mean lack, not having, but not necessarily wanting to have, if that makes sense. It may be something bad, and I might be like celebrating my want of this bad thing, because it means I don't have it. Uh, and if you check an English to English dictionary, it is more likely that you will find those older definitions there. Um, so after you read, and you come to class, we will be discussing these questions. These are all open-ended questions. I will not ask you something like, oh, where was this person born? Or like, uh, what does it say on page 32? Very boring questions. I'll be asking you questions like, uh, do you agree with this character's actions? Or what do you think this character is thinking? Or why do you think the play has this element at this time? Open-ended questions. In this class, there are no wrong answers. Now, of course, there are better answers and there are worse answers. But the worst answer you could possibly give me will always have some part that is good and that we can build on during the discussion. So don't worry if, about like, getting a question wrong because it's impossible to give a wrong answer. That goes for the discussion questions and it also goes for the exam questions. The exam questions are also open-ended questions, uh, but they are bigger questions. These questions all focus on specific parts of the text. The exam question 
will focus on the entire text, a question that encompasses the entire thing. Uh, and that's partly why it's an open book, open internet question, uh, exam, because you're going to need to look things up. Um, so again, when you take the exam, don't worry about getting it wrong. Worry more about giving me a better answer. So what is a better answer? The classic uh, understanding of interpretation is the more evidence from the text that you can explain, and the more coherent and logical you can make the explanation, the better your answer is. So if I ask you, like, oh, why did this character say this? If you answer, oh, because he was feeling scared, that's fine. It's a correct answer, not wrong. But if you answer by saying, oh, he was scared, and when he's scared, like, he reacts in this way because of the way he grew up, and also in that situation, these other people were doing this to him, that's more evidence, and therefore, it's a better answer. But also, if you say, oh, when he's scared, he does something, but then maybe he's not scared because other people are something, something, something. That's not a better answer exactly because it doesn't fit together. Does that make sense? Uh, I think it's more important for your answer to fit together well. And then after you have a basic uh, response, then you can add more evidence. If you just give me all the evidence and you don't put it together, it's not really a good answer. Don't worry, we'll practice this uh, every week as we do the discussion questions. Um, right, that is the introduction to this course. Questions? I'm not just being polite, I do want to answer any questions that you may have. Yes. Hey, teacher, so you, you mean we have to make a group to discuss the you know, cases? Right. Uh, I will divide you into small groups today, later. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Other Thank questions? Do you have to take a textbook? Uh, textbook. No, I will provide you with all the text using handouts. So you might end up collecting a lot of paper. Thank you. Um, you're free to use Chinese if you want, but of course, this is the English department. I do encourage you to use English. Other questions? Okay, um, let's, let's talk a bit first about Dr. Faustus, which you will be reading before next week. Christopher Marlowe, the, the author, was born one, uh, I think in the same year as Shakespeare. So that gives you a sense of the history. Uh, he's generally known as the second best playwright, again, after Shakespeare, in English. Uh, he's one of the first, he wrote earlier than, than Shakespeare, actually. He started pub doing plays earlier than Shakespeare. And the, the way that he wrote those plays was, was quite different from uh, people who wrote plays before him. He, first of all, he used, uh, blank verse. Well, of course, the people before him also used blank verse, but he did it in a clear and powerful way that felt more natural to people who speak English every day. Now, if you don't know, blank verse is simply uh, unrhymed iambic pentameter. I don't think that helps. Uh, iambic pentameter is a kind of poetry where if you read it out, out loud, it kind of sounds like this. Next line. Da, 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 da. It has a, a steady rhythm. Uh, and this uh, playwrights usually use blank verse because it's easier for the actors to remember their lines. The same reason that Homer uh, wrote his, well, not wrote, remembered his uh, epic poems using, uh, I think it was dactylic hexameter. It's also a kind of poetic rhythm to help him remember. And it's important for the actors to remember their lines because they did a lot of plays. Uh, today, if you go to see a play, you might see like one or two plays per year. Uh, actors back then put on five different plays in the same week. They really had to remember their stuff. 
On the other hand, they didn't have to remember everything. They only had to remember their own parts. Acting uh, in that period is very different from acting as we think about it today. If you like watch the Oscars and they give like best acting award to someone, and you watch the movie, it's usually a kind of like very artsy drama movie. People are suffering and they have inner torture and whatever. Back in those days, acting was always broad and loud and expressive. They were always playing to the crowd. Emotions were clear and undeniable. Uh, and so when we read the play, there will be some lines where Faustus, the main character, is talking to himself. Now, to us, that seems weird. Why would you talk to yourself uh, for no reason? Why would you debate with yourself out loud? But in that time, it was necessary because uh, there was no such thing as an interior uh, acting. It was al always put out there for the audience. Now, this also means that uh, plays of that era were or could be exciting. There were sword fights, explosions, like collapsing columns, things like that. It was very exciting. Uh, and we'll also see some of that in this play as well. And the reason we'll see that is because Dr. Faustus is the legend of the guy who sells his soul to the devil. Uh, and the devil gives him like supernatural powers and lets him have fun with his life. Uh, but the central question of this play, therefore, is, first of all, uh, can he get out of that contract? And secondly, is it worth it? Marlowe had a tendency to write plays about people who had too much ambition, someone who loved too deeply, someone who tried to conquer too much of the world. In this case, someone who wanted to conquer death or to conquer human limitations. And though uh, most of these people got the end that they deserved, the way, the route that they took to that uh, ending of correct morality often displayed uh, a different kind of morality. Things could get violent, things could get strange and perverse. And so, that's one reason why people considered Marlowe to be uh, like the bad boy of Elizabethan drama. The other reason is because he was a government spy who was assassinated at 29 years old in a bar fight with other spies. So, you know, not the best reputation. People accused him of being like gay, atheist, not believing in God, uh, like against the government, whatever. Uh, which actually, I think, is pretty on brand for Marlowe's plays. Like, they give you that feeling when you read them. Uh, so, we will be reading this play, Dr. Faustus. I should mention that this is not the first instance of this legend. The original Faust legend appeared in uh, some 5th century early Christian tales about how, you know, you shouldn't sell your soul to the devil. Uh, and that legend got passed down until it ended up in Marlowe's hands. Elizabethan playwrights of that period usually did not create entirely new stories. Usually they built on early histories, early legends, popular stories of the day, and turned them into exciting plays. Marlowe did that with the Faust legend. Uh, and uh, it is one of his most pop no, it is his most popular play. And therefore, it is his most famous play. But that doesn't mean that it's his best play. Uh, this course is called Important British Writers' Works, not Best British Writers' Works. Um, so it's still worth reading, uh, because it's, it's so well known. Um, and because it is so popular, people kept on putting on reproductions of the same play, but they kept adding things. And when you read it, you'll see. Like, once Faustus gets his powers, there's a lot of fun that he can have. And so people kept adding fun scenes for him, uh, to give him things to do. Uh, so in fact, some parts of the play that we have today, uh, we already know were not written by Marlowe. Uh, at the time, playwrights were not, like we, we think of Shakespeare as like this very important literary person. But at the time, playwrights were not very important at all. 
they wrote a play, they sold it to an acting company, and if they were not part of the acting company, they had nothing else to do with the play. That's it. The actors could change things. Uh, the boss of the acting company could change things. They could hire other writers to, to jump in and change things. You know what? It kind of sounds like the film industry today. Um, so we think of playwrights as very important, and they are because they wrote the first version. But that doesn't mean that what we read is entirely what Marlowe had in mind. Um, now, plays, of course, are not meant to only be read. They're also meant to be performed on stage. Uh, yeah, we don't have time for that. Uh, if you're interested, you can always think about what it might look like on stage. Just think of like a bare wooden stage, three stories of crowds, you know, like a circular audience section, some poor people who standing in the front couldn't afford seats. In the background, you have an entrance, an exit, and like a hiding space in the middle. Uh, two floors that could be used. So if you have like a balcony scene where people had to, to talk between floors, you had a second floor. And then uh, sometimes you had a third floor, depending on the theater, for things like uh, gods, or you know, the god, uh, or supernatural events, things like that. Uh, but it's, it's basically just a wooden stage in an open space. Everything had to be brought on using costumes, or uh, you know, like creating uh, small stage props, or like uh, stage swords. Um, these stages also had a trap door in the middle of the floor. Especially important for this play because it has a devil. And we all know devils live in hell and hell is like somewhere like down there. So when devils appear, they, they sometimes appear through the floor. Um, I think that's basically all you really need to know about this play to get started. Have you read uh, old English poetry before? Like maybe some of Shakespeare's sonnets. Um, the thing about poetry is it's supposed to be grammatical. If you arrange these lines in a single sentence, they sh it should be a correct sentence. Uh, so if you get lost in the middle, think about that. Where is the main verb? Where is the main subject? And that should help you get through uh, any troubles that you may have. Now, uh, these are all old texts. Even the Jane Austen story is from 1817. So they're available online if you want them. But the versions I have prepared for you include footnotes, which I think might be useful to you. Um, if you do use a different version, whether online or another paper version, it is your responsibility to know where we are when I say something like, okay, turn to page 420. All right? I'm not going to go around and flip to the right page for you. That's your responsibility. Uh, but of course, I do have handouts. The handouts are free. Why would you not take them? Uh, okay, so questions about Dr. Faustus. This version is the most famous version in English. But actually, the most famous version of the Faust legend uh, in the West, in Western Europe, is uh, another play written by Goethe, Goethe uh, a few, not years, like a few decades after Marlowe, that was simply called Faust. It's a better play, uh, but it's not in English, so we're not reading it. It's in German. OK, so that's the introduction to next week's reading. Uh, now let's, where's the sign-in sheet? Thank you. Uh, okay, let's make sure everyone's here.